Welcome to Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Hello, Otterites. This is episode 154. I am Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. All right, gentlemen. This is Robert sitting in the captain's chair today. We are in Studio R uh, in the atrium here at uh, my place, enjoying the view. Granted, it's uh, kind of bare because it's still uh, early in the year. But But I do hear a robin outside. Yes. There is a robin singing, so a a sign of spring here at the atrium. Absolutely. I think we're supposed to hit around 60 today, so it's going to be real nice uh, in here. Probably have to turn on the fan a little bit later. (laughs) <laughs> Say it in so. <laughs> Maybe open up the door and uh, have have the screen screen door there. Yeah, screen the the little air in here would be awesome. Yeah. So uh, we're here at the atrium, and uh, it is fitting because I am the captain of this first episode we're doing today, and this one is one that I've had uh, on the uh, the list of things to do, and uh, it is about the peace peace of Westphalia. Uh, these are the two treaties actually that ended. The 30 Years and the 80 Years War going on in Europe at the time. and Boy, 80 years is a long time to have a war. It is. I mean, we thought Afghanistan was long. I know. Yeah. Uh, it still didn't beat the 100 Years War, mind you guys. It still didn't. That's but, right. But uh, it's close. But, you know, the they, were, they really were two separate wars yeah. uh, going on, but they just happened to be ended at the same time. Because by the time 30 Years War comes around, uh, pretty much the entire continent is involved. Uh, so... Uh, Peace of Westphalia is... And this is this is the first of... We're going to do a kind of a series of... Yeah. Oh, sort our, of treaty peace... Yes. Uh, ...things. European peace treaties. Yeah, our next four history episodes over the next four months will be about basically treaties that changed the world. Right. And created the worlds that we live in today. And this one we're starting with because it really is the, the one that changed Europe... That's right. Uh, ...the most... Uh, dramatically uh, as far as European history goes. This one really uh, was truly the first multinational agreement, Mm -hmm. uh, which is really important. So treaties are not unknown to history. Rome entered into treaties all the time. Right. They're ancient. Yeah, this one is a really big deal. And it's more than just ending the war. Right, we'll get it into. really is more. Because so, most, most treaties at this point were like, okay, we're going to agree, we're going to stop fighting, you give me this, I give you that, we go away, and everybody everybody wins. Right. Actually, that's the way and, they're written. And two <laughs> years later, Rome would break it. Uh, well, that's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> After and, they built themselves back up. And in this case, you know, this is one of the first treaties, if not the first treaty, that is truly between nations as opposed to rulers. Of nations. That's a critical point, too. And that is Glad a you critical that. point. So, uh, just a little bit of background uh, so we understand why this is important. What what comes... Because, again, context, right? We're all about context. Context. Good job. So, sir. 30 Years' War, 1618 to 1648. 80 Years' War, 1568 to 1648. Uh, two totally different conflicts that are happening simultaneously for that last 30 years. Uh, the first one, the 30 Years' War, well, technically it's the second, but the first one we're talking about. Uh, is really for control of the Holy Roman Empire. Political control as well as religious control. Uh, It is truly the uh, one of, if not the final, European war of religion. Because at this time, it's really difficult to unwind secular ruling from religious. Right, because all of the monarchs at this time subscribe to divine right, absolute rule. Mm -hmm. Now, by this time, absolute rule is mostly gone. Uh, they are somewhat constrained, but it's that's still something that if any guys came one of those monarchs, absolutely, absolute rule. Yeah. Uh, whether or not but they actually can exercise it. There's no real concept of a separation of church and state. Right. No, that's for the next century. Yeah, the only separation is that, you know, other than in England, the, the king is not the head of the church, uh, which, you know, that, that's an outlier. And England really does not come into play in in these conflicts because they got their own crap going on. This is during uh, the reign of Charles the uh, First. You know, it, it, he comes to his end uh, right around this time. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and, I mean, he's, he's beheaded the next year, right? Yeah, sixteen forty nine. So, you know, and so he had tons of unrest leading him. So he didn't have the money or the political capital to spend in Europe. He's about the only one who didn't get involved. Yeah, yeah you can't be involved in the continent if you're. Uh... Running for your life from uh, Oliver Cromwell. Exactly, exactly. So, 
the uh, and of course the Eighty Years' War. This is Spain versus the United Provinces. Uh, you know, Spain somehow had territory in the United Provinces. You know, Netherlands and that general area where Luxembourg and, and Belgium are now. It's right. where they keep the Luxembourgers, right? Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> it's a mass joke, folks, but hey, it's still good. Uh, so that separate war is going on, and. Uh, yet that kind of starts out as a let us have our religion, but no, that, that it, doesn't I think it is, kind of morph into an independence movement. It, I think it more morphs into an independence movement if it doesn't if it's not more of that to begin with, because it really is um, about separating. Uh, now there right. are Protestants there, and yes. a lot of the wars just eventually just become the Catholics versus the Protestants. That's, yeah, that's where this kind of the gravitational yeah. pull and by Protestants the at this time. You know, we think of Protestants as, you know, 20,000 different sects that, that just call themselves not Catholic. Right, yeah. <laughs> and basically, there's two things here. And at this point, there are two major ones. There are, there's actually three major uh, schools of thought, but only Lutheranism is really officially recognized anywhere outside of the Swiss Confederacy. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, Calvinism has its adherence in other places, mm -hmm. but it's not yet one of those uh, tolerated religions uh, even in any of the places where we... Because we, we, the Peace of Augsburg uh, in 1555 kind of started this this thing where, okay, you can be not Catholic uh, in the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, but people in the provinces that chose not to be Catholic, they had to be whatever their ruler was. And that was the main thing. So you had, you know, one generation were all Protestants, you were all Lutherans, and then the you know their kids uh, take over and, oh, no, we prefer being Catholic. So everybody has to convert. And that's one of the things that uh, the people got tired of, was this whiplash back and forth uh, as they were either conquered during the war and retaken, or when rulers changed through heredity. Right, because when you talk the Holy Roman Empire, it's not a real single political entity. No, uh, so it is not truly an empire. It's more of a than anything It's else. a confederation at best. Yes, that's right. Uh, yes. And a very weak confederation. They would have loved to have had the unity that the, the U.S. had under the Articles of Confederation. Ooh, that's very well put. <laughs> yeah, that, that's because how I love that. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's a lot, a lot, like, what, two dozen or something. Oh, more than that. And so it's, There are hundreds of these little principalities, principalities, principalities yeah. uh, throughout the Holy Roman Empire. And some are very small and others are significant. Yeah, exactly. yeah, some yeah. dukedoms of Saxony, Württemberg, uh, Bohemia. Yes, well, but Bohemia was the entire kingdom uh, that was yeah. probably the largest political entity yeah. uh, out of all of those. And, and then just, a, a, like you said, a lot of tiny, a little, uh, you know, a, a, a city, a town. Right. And uh, well, then there were the imperial cities, which were, uh, again, had their own electors, but they were controlled directly by the emperor uh, or Owned, however you want to put it, so, more yeah, influence so that that during the war. Around. These cities and that would change hands lots of times. Glad you're mentioning all this as a background because we, I do believe, we as Americans, kind of when it comes to that whole concept of the Holy Roman Empire, it was far enough east that our eyes glaze over. We don't it is, really. We, we get England, we get France, we might get Spain, but the rest of it is, huh? You mean they're not the same? geopolitical entity that we know today right or geographically so because we tend to think i, I believe geographically right. and of course they had you know like you mentioned france england spain have access to the atlantic well that's directly right. and so there are forebearers whereas all of these right the germans don't have they don't they're not until yeah. they become german yeah well exactly they, right they're not having mass <laughs> immigration out of there until later as well. Right, so right. Their mass immigration is to the rest of Europe. <laughs> right, and eventually that would change, yeah. of course, but yes. you're talking 1800s. Right, again, yeah. not until Germany becomes Germany. Right, yeah. Uh, so it's, it's a very confused muddle of places with their own rulers and... Right. But generally the same ethnicities. Um, well, it's I think not at the time you would argue that because this, this encompasses... Um, what we would consider the Germanies today. Right, yes. Uh, bits of um, France, what we consider France today. Mm -hmm. Bits of what we would consider Denmark today. Right. Uh, of Poland. Uh, and, you've got the Croats, and, who yeah. were in at, still considered an ethnic group at this time. Right. Plus the Austrians and the Hungarians. Right. Uh, the Romanians, the Bohemians. So it's, it's a... 
it really is a political entity and in, in the sense that a true empire is. You know, an empire spans ethnicities. Right. And that's what I wanted to make sure we kind of teased out of that. Is... Mostly German, but like I said, there's lots of everything else. Right. I mean, they're butting up against the Italians, and that's yes. being mixed in. Uh, plus, they're fending off the Ottomans uh, yeah. constantly. Yeah, well, yeah. The Poles, and of course the Russians are not far away. Right. And uh, the, the Sweden is a... Big, big dog daddy at this point. Well, yeah, yes, Sweden, it is. Sweden's a Protestant player. Yeah. And it is. It's and so I want to talk about some, uh, some of that. Um, so basically this is the Habsburg versus everybody else, essentially, is what the Thirty Years' War is. And I want to talk about how it begins because I love this story. So yeah, go for it. <laughs> uh, it's, it's actually the third defenestration of Prague. So apparently you don't want to hold any serious negotiations in Prague. Because if they get pissed off at you, they're going to throw you out the window. That's literally what the defenestration of is. I love that, because yep. that's what that means, is throwing people out of windows. Right. So when this happens, this third defenestration, uh, the negotiations over, uh, over the succession of the empire. So Frederick uh, and Ferdinand, as well as Maximilian of Bavaria, are all kind of vying for who's going to... Uh, and Actually, it might be that Frederick died... Or Frederick, because there's Frederick and Frederick and Ferdinand, and then you know Ferdinand his, has his own son Ferdinand during this period, and Max is the only one over there that doesn't have a name that sounds similar, so he's easy to keep straight. But at the time, the major electors uh, are only slightly more Catholic than Protestant in number, and so it was a near thing whether or not the Holy Roman Empire very nearly went Protestant mm-hmm. uh, at this time, but. So during these negotiations negotiations over who they would select after the last emperor died, uh, you know, they went off the rail, they throw the, the, the Protestants out the window, they survived, they didn't die, and the war ends up kicking off because of this. And it really does become the struggle over Catholic versus Protestant mm-hmm. in the entire empire then. And just about everybody in Europe becomes involved because every monarch owns one of those principalities, at least one of those little towns or duchies or principalities or uh, some piece of it that they have claim to an elector. And if you are, you know, whatever religion you are and you want help, then you've got to go to a co-religionist and say, please come help me. Not necessarily. Because France supported the Protestants. Because France are Bourbons, 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 uh, and the the emperors are Habsburgs. Mm -hmm. And so even though they're both Catholic, France is always going to be against the Habsburgs because Spain is also controlled by the Habsburgs. Yes, because the Habsburgs are on their doorsteps. Right. They are um, are to the south, they are to the west. Which leads much later to the War of Spanish Succession, which was much much after all this. uh, And Spain is very powerful at this time. Right. But, you know, they're more concerned with the Americas, because they're the primary power there. Uh, Because even even though England still has colonies, you know, it's still just toehold over there. Right. Compared to what Spain has. And Spain is still busy looting uh, everything from Mexico south. Yeah, everything is not nailed down. They're bringing back they're to bringing back to Europe to Europe, and that's how they're funding the Eighty Years' War and their wars in the Italian Peninsula, because that's so that's their primary focus. Um, but still, everybody has a claim, and because of the nature of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, you know, Christian of Denmark, Christian the Fourth of Denmark, uh, who owns all of Norway at this time. And so as a major player, and Gustavus uh, Adolphus, uh, and I forget the last name, uh, but uh, he is the ruler of uh, Sweden, yeah. and he is also a major player, and so they, because they are on the continent as well, they have conquered some of these principalities, that's how they become involved. Uh, the Poles are tangentially involved, because uh, they have their own issues uh, going on around this time, but there is a, a separate war with them, so Europe is just constantly filled with war during this time. Mm-hmm. There is not a time when somebody's not fighting somebody else. Yeah. And Russia is very backwards at this time. Yes, Russia is still fairly it, backwards. This is before Peter the Great comes and, yes. and makes them a true 
imperial power. Right, when he looks uh, to when, the west. And he looks to the west to do that. And right, this is some of what you're... 75 years prior to that. Exactly, and the, the Russians are, I mean, they're, they're very backwards in many ways. They're almost, uh, they're agrarian, they're they're building with wood instead of stone. It's, I mean, there's, they're almost like back there. But St. Petersburg but, doesn't even exist. No, it doesn't even exist. Right, because well, they, they, they don't, don't buy him. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they don't even have ports so, on the ocean or anything. Right. Yeah, and is, even Moscow is, is is just a tiny little backwater at this time. Right, yeah. yeah Kiev is actually more the the center. There's, Iron, there's, there's an irony for you. That's yes. right. Uh, of of this of that area, which it would come into its own thanks to Peter. We probably ought to do a Peter the Great episode, by the way. He would be a good guy to talk about because he does a lot of stuff. Uh, but there's that tension with the Poles, tension with the Turks, and all that stuff like that, which that keeps the Poles active. And Sweden is still rising at this time. It, and yes. it would be Peter who would take them down you know, yeah. 80 years later. Mm-hmm. But right. at this point here, they are in full ascendancy. And they are like the masters well, of warfare in many King, ways. King, King Augustus, uh, Gustav, not Augustus, Gustav Adolphus, uh, whatever it is. I can't remember the, the, the family name. It's escaping me for whatever reason. Uh, he is a brilliant battlefield commander, yes. except for one thing. He led from the front. That's correct. <laughs> yes. And it led to his death at Breitenfeld. Uh-huh. Uh, or Lutzen, I think. Not Breitenfeld. Breitenfeld was a great victory for him. Uh, and he routed the Catholic forces uh, of Tilly, I think it was. And he dies in just a year later in at Lutzen, and it really halts the progress of the, the Protestants because he's the main driver at that That's time. right, yeah. And But the interesting thing I want to talk about the, the, the monarchs at this time. So you've got Louis the Thirteenth in France mm-hmm. who's really, you know, he's not a great ruler. Richelieu, on the other hand, is his prime minister. And is. In, in name, if, if not in name, in fact. Mm-hmm. And he's the driving force. And as we talked about in the, the Louis the Fourteenth episode, Richelieu is a great patriot, as Americans would understand him. Yes. Uh, whatever is for the greater glory of France is what he is for. And he's damned efficient, too. And he is very good at it. Yes. Uh, and then you have um, Ferdinand as the Habsburg emperor. Mm-hmm. And then you have uh, Gustav, king of Sweden. Those are the, the three primary ones I want to talk about, because um, especially Gustav and Ferdinand, and also Maximilian, Maximilian of Bavaria, they are not entirely out for land grabs. There is that, because they're a monarch of the, of the era. That's right. just part of being a monarch. You want to expand your kingdom. But they are also extremely concerned with the faith aspect. Mm-hmm. Uh, Maximilian especially was apparently a devout Catholic. And he was concerned uh, about keeping the spread of heresy in check. Because... From a Catholic perspective, Protestantism is a heresy. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's how, and that's how it's viewed. So they had, by today's standards, you, you wouldn't call them noble motives. But by their standards, absolutely, they had noble motives. Yeah. So that's what, uh, yeah, gave, yeah, that's yeah, what gave traction. You know, that's what, yeah. that's what enabled people to, to sign on. Yes. Because you've got this veneer. Uh, of of respectability and nobility, and this kind of goes back to the Crusades. You know, we talked about yes. that. It's, it's like a European crusade. It, it really is. It's kind of like we're gonna. It, it, we, you love to fight. We're gonna give you an honorable reason to do so, yeah. and that's kind of where this unfortunate same thing is. Just like with sacking Constantinople, there are horrendous uh, atrocities. Oh yeah, that are committed on both sides. Very much so. Uh, Gustav's troops are no less. Uh, 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 brutal, brutal than Ferdinand's or Richelieu's. Although the French don't get as actively involved until after uh, the death of Gustav, uh, they're more the latter half, right? Uh, because they just they didn't have to. They were funding Gustav, right? So they were more than happy to, to give him money. Well, that's Richelieu. You know, why should we fight when we pay you to do the fighting? Right. It's pretty easy on our part. It's exactly. just a loss of an investment if things go well. Well, the amount of money they gave was approximately 2% of their national budget. It was 25% of, of uh, uh, Sweden's. Yeah. So that's how they funded the, yeah. the war. France was really the power of the day. Yeah. So, you know, the, all the monarchs are involved. And it's not a 30-year <coughs> battle. You know, there's no. lords. Uh, and it's a battle between armies. This is... Uh, 
still in a Napoleonic sense, uh, in the sense that you have armies that battle armies, <clears throat> not in the more modern sense where you have armies that conquer cities. Right. But yes, they want to conquer the city so they can loot them, sometimes peacefully, sometimes not. Right. Uh, the, probably the greatest atrocity uh, was committed by Tilly, uh, a Catholic, uh, for the Catholics against the city of Madburg. Uh, Madburg was basically annihilated. And the uh, apparently Tilly tried to restrain the troops. Restrain the troops, but it was one of those things where because the city resisted, that's it. Yep. The troops basically thought they had free reign to go in and rape and pillage. That was and, a very medieval and, idea, but it yes. persisted very much so. As you know, if it did, if if you surrender, we'll be nice. But if you get our blood up and our dander up, right, we will uh, rape you, kill you, pillage you, and right. burn you to the ground. In that order, usually, that's right. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, uh, Henry, yes, you got to make sure you rape first before you burn. Well, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's or kill. Right. Or kill. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, that's it. Hey, it went on. You know that it did. Uh, Henry V talks, Shakespeare talks about it in Henry V, a uh, brilliant speech that Henry makes at Harfleur, you know, about you know what will happen if you don't surrender. Right. And it, it's very clearly, graphically for the time, uh, explains exactly how this was. And it so, was still going on. Yeah. So and this is even in the age of gunpowder. Oh, yes. I, these are early weapons, you right. know, smooth bores. Uh, you know, we're not talking about uh, anything even rifled yet. Yeah, mostly cannon was the was the big dog. Yeah. Yes, cannon cavalry cavalry is still a big deal. The, yep. the Croats apparently were known for their cavalry. Uh, and they were it's, used... it's like cavalry with lances. Yes, and, and... in which Napoleon would take you know, I mean, make a whole you know whole corps of lancers. You know, that was his. He yeah. he learned that you know historically from these from yeah, these, these times. These are definitely for the most part battles out in empty fields. Yes. Against formations, and you got kind of one shot. Yes. And you got the was, Spanish tertios. Yeah, uh, running everybody through. Are kind the, of deal. these big squares? Of yes, the troops. famous squares. And you know the Spanish were uh, you know by by the middle of this war, the Spanish are involved uh, because you know the United Provinces are right there. They're going to be drawn in because they're opportuni- opportunistic as well. Mm-hmm. So. Once the Spanish get involved, especially uh, with uh, the, the Catholic forces fighting the Catholic forces, it gets really crazy. But those Spanish tercios are incredibly um, powerful and dangerous to, to those who uh, they are going up against. So it's just a crazy, convoluted mess. And at the heart of it, basically, you got a bunch of greedy, opportunistic efforts. I won't drop the F-bomb this time. All right, good, good. Uh, but they are, for the most part, they are, with the exception of the, those that I mentioned earlier by name. I mean, they are too, but they also have other motives. Most of the players in this, they're just out for a land grab. Mm-hmm. And as we talked about in the, the Louis XIV episode, uh, the Thirty Years' War is the first world war in the term, as we would think of it, like the first world war in yeah. Europe. In yeah, I mean, right. it's it was just it was small, it. it was just a smaller scale, slightly was, yeah. geographically speaking. Right, it's the first. All continent war, yeah, that's which right. we now yeah. call, you know, so, which is what it was in nineteen fourteen, nineteen eighteen, except it had the naval aspect. Not a whole lot of naval battles in, in this one. Well, also you had other players by that time because the, Russia right. was you not a player Russia, here. You did have the Turks. That's you did right. have some other things, but for the most part, I would call this World War Zero. Absolutely, it, it, it's a because it is the precursor to that later conflict. Yeah. It shows them how they fight each other and how they make up with each other. Yes, and I say it's a precursor because what comes out of this uh, essentially lays down the boundaries that we are familiar with today in rough form. I mean, the the, the lines still change, uh, but for the most part, we recognize uh, when you take out all the principalities and just leave the Holy Roman Empire, we recognize, oh, that's Germany. Mm -hmm. And whatever else that is underneath, you know, because obviously Germany is much smaller now than what the the empire was. Um, So... This is the milieu that comes out of this. Now, once the French are directly involved, that's when Ferdinand and Maximilian end up having to not surrender, but at least negotiate a peace. Because they've been at it for 30 years. They've essentially lost on the battlefield, but still France can't impose its will as a permanent thing. Something I wish the U.S. would learn. You know, that we cannot necessarily occupy every country that we defeat. Right. Uh, and what Russia is learning now that, that right. you know it's even hard to defeat the country next door much less occupy them and uh, out of this comes the peace of Westphalia 
Yeah. And so, yeah. Uh, I mean, kind of at some point, you got to give them a little bit of credit of, of look, war, this is freaking pointless. Right. We're, now, Mazarin, uh, as you know, we, as we talked about in Louis XIV, we give him a lot of credit for a lot so. of things, for being the moderating influence uh-huh. on Louis XIV, uh-huh. uh, for being his primary teacher. Uh, and as we said, any good that we ascribe to Louis, we trace back to Mazarin. And which you can also trace back to Richelieu. Richelieu trained Mazarin how to be uh, the the next head guy in right. France. Mm-hmm. And he did it in only two years. Right. But although Ma- Mazarin was already a, a skilled diplomat. He was, Mazarin was a far more moderate influence than Richelieu was. Yes, he was still like Richelieu. All for the greater glory of France. That's correct. He bought, even though he was Italian, yeah. uh, the nephew of Pope Urban VIII, he bought into France as France at uh, 100%. Daughter, first daughter of the church. The eldest daughter the of the church. Greatest, uh, uh, or shall we, as Jean-Luc Picard would say, representative civilization for centuries. That's exactly. Same thing. Uh, so, I bet you were wondering where I was going to get But he was the architect one. of these, the, the primary architect of these treaties. Uh, he drove it. Now, others obviously had input because they're two separate treaties taking place in, in multiple cities, but it's his power and influence that drives it, yeah. which I find ironic because he didn't rule France and Louis didn't rule France as if he were bound by these treaties, yeah. uh, which you is know, kind of interesting. One of the interesting things about the negotiations, there's no place neutral right. to meet, and nobody would meet on the other guy's side, so they had to be in two cities that were close together, but that were occupied by their own forces yes. and just run people back and forth with yeah. the, with, with all this stuff. That's right. Yeah, nobody... They, 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 they well, trust each other. other. They, exactly. The level of distrust was so extreme. Yeah. Uh, I've been thinking about it. You've been fighting for 30 years. Okay, well, I can but there, there's a lot of... Uh, there's a lot of reason for that distrust. Right. There are a lot of examples of history of... Hey, why don't you come over? We'll sit down. We'll talk. We'll eat a big meal. And oh, by the way, you don't know this, but I'm going to have all my archers there. They're going to kill you. Right. It's well, the red wedding. I was going to say, where do you think George R. R. Martin got the idea? I mean, well, it's the, the it's the Cylon peace initiative. That's exactly it. Uh, you know, they get those from from history. Yeah, exactly. yeah. It's I mean, that, that goes all the way back to Oda Walker and and uh, oh, what's his name? Uh, um. One of the one of the, it goes all the way back to the four hundreds and the five hundreds in, in Rome and and you know uh, Theodosius and yeah, yeah, all that yeah. business. Yeah. Uh, you know the. Well, I'm sure Nero did it too. You know the yeah. whole uh, Old Walker's the client king of Italy and he's reporting to Constantinople, but oh by the way we're also giving all of Italy to you know this uh, the, the Ostrogoths and right. <laughs> it's dead. Yeah. Let's meet in Ravenna and have a good meal. We'll talk about this. Oh, by the way, I'm going to cut your freaking head off. Right. So, so yeah, th- there's valid reasons to the, that it went on like this. So that's the, the, the background that this piece is built on. Uh, one, it's very shaky. Nobody trusts anybody else. Right. And everybody has their own self-interest at heart, which is normal. Yeah, uh, but they're not interested in being honorable about much uh, going into this. Yeah, this is a ruthless war compared think, to many before. Oh, yes. This this brought... Because this really did involve a lot of sacking of cities. That's right. And uh, eight, I mean, some was, 8 million people died during these 30 years. Doesn't sound like a lot for 30 years, especially yeah. compared to World War One and World War Two. But that's a significant percentage of the population. Yeah. yeah, more. and in many respects, it's the attitudes learned here that would pay forward into those other conflicts centuries later yeah. that would explain, you know, we're not, we're no longer, this gentleman game business is for the birds. You don't, you know, uh, you don't really win. You only right. just delay. Yeah. And that's part of what's laid out. Yeah, this is probably the first case of, even though, like I said, where there's a lot of maneuvering and battles in the fields, uh, for, 30, for 30 years, if there's warfare, you're going to besiege towns. Right? So there is a lot of Sacking going on. That's you know. That's why the the people are. T- I, and I think what this war did, and why it ended up working on the continent, was not because France imposed anything with their mighty military, because they really didn't police no. anything. Everybody was just exhausted. Right. And that's why I think it ended up working. 
they wore themselves and the people <laughs> out. And they wore everybody out, yeah. Uh, I mean, when you think about it, the 8 million people out of the population of what is mostly Germany, mm-hmm. Germany didn't have the manpower to do anything. You know, the, the Germanys, the Holy Roman Empire. Well, uh, they, they, she, Sweden would have suffered enormous losses. Mm-hmm. Spain would have, I mean, and even France would have suffered, even though France was mostly victorious. Uh, they spent a lot of money. Supporting everybody, and France dealt with their own uh, Fondés uh, rebellions right after this because of was being it, involved. Yes, in because of the money that was involved yes. in that, which would, in many respects, set up the future. Yes, that that went from there. So that's where all of this comes from. So, and I know we spent you know half of our episode on setting this up, but I think it's important. Yeah, yeah, oh, to absolutely. understand this. Yeah. So it's a good spot for a stop for a for a bourbon break uh, or a, a belly break, maybe. Yes, because we want to talk about our morning. So, Indeed. as as Martin said, coming out of uh, Biscuit Belly, which as we all know is the official breakfast uh, establishment of uh, Snakes and Otters, uh, you know we haven't done any work, and it's already been the best day. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a beautiful day. Our bellies are full of biscuits and hash browns and sausage and the like. And gravy, and and gravy. Oh, gravy. Don't, don't forget to try some more gravy with that. That's right. Yeah, I didn't get gravy. that asked today, but that's okay. No. But no, but that's, I, I could have asked. the 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 service we got today was primo. It always, oh, it always is, it always oh, is but it was exceptionally yeah, so today. It was, it was they were nice. they they were not exceptionally busy, and hey, it, you know it's, it's early. Well, it was seven o'clock or eight o'clock in the morning, so yeah, on uh, Saturday. Uh, Nevertheless, they were they were spot on it. So were, if, yes. if by some wild chance the owners of Biscuit Belly are listening, and yes, we will be happy to advertise for you if you like. Uh, yes, you can even pay for the advertising we are giving you now. That's right. Yeah. This this or is the give freebie. Us a free breakfast. Here's know? your here's your freebie. We can talk later. Uh, uh, Colonial Gardens location. Well, that's yes, Colonial Gardens. Gardens. That's right. That's where we're at because uh, there is more than one. Right. Yeah, so uh, we want want that staff to know that we appreciated them. Uh, this morning, the, the food is excellent. The service is excellent. It's, there's a reason it's the official breakfast spot. Yes. It's not the only breakfast spot because we right, can, but it is the official. It's one. our official. If, one. if we could go to Breakfast Belly over by your guys' place, we would. That's yeah, correct. Yeah. So Biscuit Belly, I know you got St. Matthews, but you need to look really hard at Fern Creek. Yeah, lots there, of development. Lots Come of development. Out. That Cedar Creek place is going to have open spots. That would be an outstanding place for a belly. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, no bourbon really this morning. It's a little early for me to have a bourbon. Uh, and plus, I'm so full. Well, but, that's the side problem with yes, eating a belly. Yeah, have just one small little way for one, 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 one small and, we, and the cleaning lady, we will call her. Yes, <laughs> that's right. Uh, but, you know, but, you know, this would be a good time to have the maple bourbon. I was going to say that very yeah. same thing. That would have been a good morning bourbon. Yes, I like to call it my breakfast. I don't have it for breakfast, but it is a my breakfast bourbon. Or I, I, I do drink like more that. in the morning. I would have that. So, but anyway, so we can metaphorically have this. Okay, hey, this is audio, folks. We can have right. our morning bourbon, uh, maple bourbon. Because you know, it's morning. sweet, uh, but still got a good uh, good set of flavors uh, that, that complement that. Uh, and of course, you know. Just that, that aroma of maple just really makes me think of pancakes and sausage. Really well, what was it Robin Williams said? Absurd, but flaccid. <laughs> yes, absurd, but flaccid. Talking about wine, yes. Wine, yeah. But um, well, yes, thank you very much, Biscuit Belly. We've, it, wow, it was good. Oh, my I gosh, mean, just so good. Wow. Uh, just, those donuts got, like, you had. What were those? Right. The bonuts. The bonuts. So that's just the, you know, the little fried dough, but sugar. Right, yeah, uh, powdered sugar and cinnamon, right? Or is it cinnamon? It's or just it's just regular sugar. Regular right? sugar. Well, they're right? donut yeah. balls, basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. They're like donut holes from yeah, only that. It's, it's like yeah, just the the sugar donuts. Uh, and then that cream cheese icing. Yes, yeah, so which I should not have touched, but wow, it was, was that good. good? Oh yeah. Well, yeah. Now of course we had the uh, the bre- uh, the breakfast tots, which are those homemade tater tots that are. With bacon inside. Yeah, and they're deep fried with that aioli sauce. Oh, that is so good. Yes, indeed. Biscuits and some of the best sausage ever. Oh, yeah. And just great hash browns just made perfect. Um, And coffee. Oh, thank you for that. I don't have coffee coffee. there. Even though I have a morning coffee every day, I have my coffee before we go. Because the the coffee, uh, it sits heavier on me than water. And when I eat, I need to, if I'm going to have a big meal, I, you know, even though I shouldn't, I have water with it, uh, to, you know, because i got the, the lap band. Uh, but my weight is trending back down again, thankfully. I've been st- stuck up in the low 230s. Uh, you, you didn't have to say the number, you know. We like, no, that's yeah. back under 230, which is good. 
Yeah. But I need to get down to 180. That's my ultimate goal. Ta! Haven't been there since high school. Myself. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, I was there after college. I was like uh, 160, 170, I think, when I graduated. Uh, so but anyway. I'm a little bit shorter than you, so. Depressing subject to talk about weight. Let's skip a bit. <laughs> yeah, Let's skip, skip a bit, bit brother. Right. So, so, back to the piece of Westphalia. So, anything else you guys want to add to the to the, to the the status quo before we get on to the ramifications of the piece? Bring it on. No, let's do ram- I'm ready for ramifications. I'm ready for what it meant. What right. it meant. Right. So, Westphalia, even though, to me, one of the biggest things that comes out of it, and I think it's just as important as the rest of it, is the freedom of religion uh, aspects. Now, it's not actually in any of the texts, but it's kind of a, it's understood that no longer do the subjects of a prince or a duke or anybody in an imperial city, no longer, whoever runs that imperial city, uh, no longer do any of them have to convert to the new religion of their new overlords. Right. Yeah, I mean, so they can have an official religion. Nobody's willing to give that up. Absolutely right. It's, not. There's still a principle of whatever the ruler's religion is, that's the, that's quote, the state religion, religion of the place, but you don't have to bounce back and forth anymore. Right. And uh, it also meant that you could worship your religion, in your religion, in public. Now, one thing I read, which I didn't realize this, is that during the prescribed hours. So you could only do it during certain times, but you could do it. You could, yeah. I mean, you, know, you could actually go to church. Right. Uh, which, you know, in England, you still could not do uh, yeah. at this time. Uh, you know, I, I mean, they'd let some Protestants in, but you still could not worship as a Catholic uh, for not at all. much time. You know, you know yeah. a whole long time. So that's important. The other thing it did as far as religion goes, or two things, it legitimized Calvinism as an option. Which is yes. the first time for that yeah. outside of... Like you said, basically it was Lutheranism and Catholicism, but now there's a third player. Right. Which also opens the door to the explosion... Because this is when the explosion of Protestant sects really take right. off. Right. This is right. when it really starts to split Calvinist traditions, split Presbyterianism, Anabaptist, all that business starts to happen. Right. So that starts to take off uh, because... the. As they start to split, they become less liturgical. Uh, Lutherans are high liturgy looking. Uh, again, there's probably a high and a low, just like in Anglicanism. Mm-hmm. There's a high liturgy and a low liturgy uh, that looks very plain and not nearly as much like a Catholic Mass. But at this time, all the primary ones looked like Mass. Mm-hmm. So what you're saying here is we have the peace of Westphalia to blame for... Church services with tambourines and snakes. Pretty much. Pretty much. <laughs> well, and actually, ultimately... And, and ultimately, Martin the Heathen comes up with that one. Wow. <laughs> ultimately, I'll go you one better. It's all Pope Julius' fault. Ultimately, it is all of this is the fault of Pope Julius. I was going to save this for the end, but since you brought it up, I will go there. Mm-hmm. So, uh, as you know, uh, about uh, four <clears throat> years ago, uh, Mrs. Robert and I went to Rome. Loved it. Oh my gosh, I could spend all summer in Rome and, and Florence and, and Assisi. Uh, just fantastic. And one of the things that uh, the priest who went on the trip was uh, my former pastor. Uh, somebody had told him once, uh, I think it was, um, he was in Rome either, and it was either somebody who he was on the trip with or somebody he knew there at one of the American colleges, whatever. They were talking about how grand and beautiful St. Peter's was. And this older priest who, uh, spouting his wisdom, said, yes, and all it cost us was Northern Europe. <laughs> because this, what, the, the, the sale of indulgence, which was a perversion of what an indulgence yeah, is. intended to be, yeah. And what it's intended to be, in which the church allowed because we had some greedy MFers at the time. They were trying to build their own legacy. And granted, the legacy was beautiful and a great thing for the patrimony of the church, but it really hurt the church in many ways. So because of that, you have Martin Luther, uh, your namesake, mm-hmm. uh, and which is obviously just a dig at us. Uh, not obviously, but it's a dig at us uh, in many ways, which is fine. 
which is fine. Um, and you have the the buddings of Protestantism. And right. It's it's the the concern. Julius is a is a great man, but great men often leave. A lot of mess in their wake. Yes, and he did. And, and this idea of making something grand and beautiful and long lasting, it 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 can warp your focus away from being a good shepherd of the people into this singular focus of celebrating art and the idea that that that's part of your mission and part of your ministry is to make this long lasting thing. To the glory, right? He did a bad thing for a good reason. Yeah, it's but, it, what, but yeah. underneath yeah. all that is Common. The, yeah. this yeah. corruption yeah. of the beliefs that led to someone trying to bring the church back to this idea of, you know, painting and architecture is great, but that's not what we're here for. Well, it's not even so much the painting and architecture is not what we're here for as uh, what they were trying. When it was really perverted the worst, uh, it's probably when you had the the somewhat uneducated priests out in the, the as farther away from Rome you got, yes. the worse it got, literally saying, if you pay this amount, you know, either for you or for your for dead mother, they will not go to hell. You will guarantee a place in heaven. And that is absolutely a heretical perversion of the faith. And if you asked anybody, any pope or cardinal or bishop, they would have told you that. They still look the other way, mostly. Yeah, because yeah. once the door was open and the money was coming in, it's like, okay. Well, and the Pope at this time is a secular ruler. And he is also defending himself from the Spanish. And he needs money to do that. And he needs and money the money's to do got to come from somewhere. So, you know, you put on the blanders and you take the money and... Right. And, you know, the reason this is also being done is that the original St. Peter's, which was over a thousand years old, mm -hmm. was in serious need of being replaced. The thing was falling down. I mean, you know, you had that period in Rome where it was, you know, it went from a million people at the height of the empire to maybe ten or twenty thousand uh, at, at the worst of of uh, its caretaking, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Uh, when the popes were in Avignon, uh, when they abandoned the city, the city emptied. Uh, although it probably had emptied, it had been emptying, but it got worse. When they came back, it came back, and so. A lot of things needed to be done to the city because it had been in disrepair. And so, yeah, St. Peter's needed to be replaced, but they wanted to do it big. And, you know, so that started the ball. So, yes, we have Pope Julius II and his successors uh, to blame not only for the peace, for the Thirty Years' War and the Peace of Westphalia, but also for snakes and tambourines. But it's a direct line. I know, this is like... Uh, the the great what if of what do you what would you do if you went back in history would you shoot Hitler no I would grab Julius II and smack him in the mouth so I wouldn't have to see anybody holding a snake up in a church service <laughs> like look you idiot this is what you caused <laughs> uh, I mean this is where we're headed if you don't know, smack him in the mouth it is one of the great what ifs what if uh, instead of what if you could send Will Smith back in history. <laughs> Of course oh, it was going to come up. I knew oh it was going gosh. to come up. It had to come up. Uh, so Chris Rock represents Pope Julius II, and Will Smith is, is Martin Luther. Uh, but it, it's, a, you know, it's a good question. What would have happened if Martin Luther had said, rather, because, I mean, he was a little bit bat crap crazy on, uh, on his own. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he was a brilliant writer, not entirely logical in everything, and he, and he did misunderstand some of the things that he, from a Catholic perspective. Yes, obviously. yes. Um, but he was right in a lot of things, but he was also, he was really right in what he was right about. He was just also really wrong in what he was wrong about. Uh, That's like, many, like many reformers are. Mm -hmm. uh, they they are right about what they're right about and wrong about what they're, and that's where things go off the rails. Yeah. But what if he had attempted to stay within the church and Europe stays Christendom rather than Catholicism and Protestantism. Because remember, we are Christendom. Yeah, there are reformers throughout the history yes, of the church. Yes, the church is always in need of reform. Indeed. Uh, every founder of a great religious order was a reformer. Uh, Francis uh, is the, the most uh, famous right, example. Uh, the Gregorian reforms 
yeah. 600 years before all of this. Yeah, you know, it's like the old joke, uh, I can't remember if it's the Dominicans or the... Uh, 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 the Dominicans and the Jesuits, I think it is, are arguing about uh, uh, who's the greatest religious order. And they talk about all the great things they've done and, you know, the... the uh, you know, the Jesuits say, you know, we were founded to, or the uh, Dominicans say we were founded to fight the Albigensians uh, and to, to restore uh, the faith in that respect. And the Jesuits say, well, we were founded to fight Protestants. I was like, well, but have you seen any Albigensians lately? <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, uh, so, you know, that's... <laughs> wow! <laughs> <laughs> and that's up. Uh, that's yeah. a well, that's a narrow focus joke. Uh, it is. It really is. But it still works, though. But it still works. Because uh, if, you, if you're saying there, you know, well, who, are, who are the Albigensians? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, but those are, the, those are the, what they were founded for. Uh, so it's a great what if. But anyways, yes, you, you could literally trace what happens in the Peace of Westphalia and why it was necessary. Back to Julius II, and actually, to be fair, the popes prior to him, because all of this started yeah, uh, in the yeah. before it's, he took again, over. It, it's, it's he's just it's, the one that's most associated. Yeah, it's with it. history you can't unravel. You know, you just can't take the pope out of his context, right. his situation of also being a secular ruler. You know, like, well, why was he? Why is that? Well, it's necessary because otherwise. Rome's a disaster. Well, not, and not just Rome, but all of the papal states yeah, all, will all be run of, by warlords. It's all of Italy is a disaster unless you kind of subjugate these city-states under at least the Pope, somebody. Right. And that's mainly, you know, central Europe, yeah. uh, or central Italy. The, uh, the the south, the Spanish have pretty much taken over. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to the north, you have the, uh, the commercial city-states. Uh, you know, Florence is going to be... Uh, somewhat in the middle, kind of back and forth, because Florence is a great supporter of Rome. But you have Vienna, uh, you have uh, all of the, you know, the, the mercantilist yeah. city-states. Yeah, yeah. And then again, you're, you're, once you get to the Alps, and then it's, it's the Habsburgs are right there on your shoulder. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so the this, Alps are the only thing that really kept the Habsburgs out of Italy. Yeah. Uh, so, so this whole thing then, not only does it at least give a peace, a pause to these wars, but it stabilizes the principalities and dukedoms and all that of, of the Holy Roman Empire. You don't have to go back and forth. But it also begins this, and there's some scholarship debate about this. It's, well, yes. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. But it's generally thought of as being the start of this idea of places have borders. Yes, they have real borders. Real borders. That, that are not they, permeable. Yeah. They, exceptionally permanent. You, right. That where you can control, a, a ruler controls all the way up to that border. And these other places are not supposed to meddle in your domestic affairs. Right. And Which they, are still very high sounding principles. And they are principles that all international relations are based on to this day. Yes. And that's the point. Yes. Is that's this idea, the idea of even having a border that you control. I mean, yes, it kind of... But the borders were, change they, constantly they, over the centuries yeah, I mean, through war and whatever kind reason. Kind of figurative up to this point. But this kind of gives it the force of we've all agreed to this now. Right. And, you know, and like I said, those borders will change because wars still happen. Um, negotiations still happen. You know, all, so they're not permanent. But like I said earlier, if we look at a map, we recognize that map. Yeah. As largely, uh, we can see how Europe today fits into that map. Even though there's a lot more uh, countries, uh, although if you break out the Holy Roman Empire, you, you see it's even worse. But because um, you know the interesting thing about this is that, so yes, there's borders. You don't interfere in anybody else's uh, business, uh, and you have the religious aspect to that. You know, which we all take for granted today. So again, it is the birth of the modern nation state uh, in many ways. Yeah. It's still nascent, it's still going to be refined, but that's why this is so important. Yeah. This is really the birthplace of modern Europe. Right. Uh, because Napoleon aside, this yeah. is also probably the probably I think one of if not the last time monarchs directly took the battlefield. 
So, you know, this again is a change. Monarchies become mostly an executive function, mm -hmm. not a... Uh, direct military. Direct military function. Uh, you know, they are still directing the military, but I mean, yeah. they are... Yeah. They do what, you know, the president does now. They sit in their capital and they tell the other guys what to do. Uh, so that, I think, also helps with the stability. Because, you know, you kill the monarch in battle, traditionally that means you take, you, you've won the war and you take over. Well, that's no longer a thing. So I think that helps stabilize borders as well. Right, and, and makes it more difficult to really win and, and consume or subsume another political entity right. into yours. Right. In Europe. I mean, you know, you could probably argue that uh, the, the battles to retake England for the Stuarts mm -hmm. uh, was probably the real last time, because uh, I want to say that uh, Charles II did battle, but I'm not sure about that. Uh, I know forces did it in his name, but I'm not entirely sure how much he, if he actually. No, did not anything. really. Uh, he he was uh, he he preferred Charles II is pretty wily in many ways. A he did wild, uh, very good. Yeah. That's exactly. If you right. want to talk about a gnarly Charlie, he was the original. Oh, yeah, very much so. Uh, but he was never really stable at home. He no. he uh, he had to fight Parliament a lot back and forth. Well, he was trying to before times. he got. I mean, just reachieving the throne. Right, absolutely. Uh, you know, the Scots were battling for him. The Scots did not, or a, some of the Scots, not all of the Scots. Yeah, the Scots are very much. They like that very strict Calvinistic outlook that yeah. Cromwell and had. And the Stuarts were the Scottish line, of course. And they were. So that's they, why they, there, there were Scots that. That's fought one of the, for That's him. the reason that you know. Uh, 50, 80 years later, you know, you've got Culloden and all that stuff. It's all based upon that. Uh, but at the time, Charles II was, you know, he was... He's in as, France. That's right. He's, he's in France. And Cromwell holds everything together by his iron fist and his efficiency. Yes. And his successors, his sons in particular, they didn't have it. Right. And people were thinking, you know, this wasn't so bad before. If we could just control this king, we'd be okay with this. And Charles says, I'm here. They bring him back, put yeah. him back in, and you know, there's restrictions and all that. And he, he bucks the line several times and wins most of the time because he's Charles. Well, he's still the king. He's still the king, yeah, and, and he, they he still respected that. Parliament home a few times. And they because Parliament, I think, the English people in particular realize, you know, that whole beheading the king thing, maybe we shouldn't have done that. That right. they, they're, they're shamed by that, uh, collectively speaking. And they, and they are able to... Push a lot of that onto Cromwell. Yeah, so you can make the argument him. that you know, even though even though uh, Westphalia was not, uh, you know, they were not a party to that, okay. it did have some effect. It on had the religious effect aside, mm -hmm. but I think it's partially also you know England's an island, and it's just, just nobody wants to invade them anymore. You know, the Saxons were the last ones to really, or, and the Normans were the last ones really to, to come over and really do any major invading. It's like you know, even the Germans in World War II, it's like. It's just not worth it. For yeah. whatever reason. I don't know. So, but the piece of Westphalia, though, it really does lay the, the groundwork for modern international relations, which is really uh, crucial for the formation of Europe. Right. It's uh, how we think of what a nation is. Yeah. Uh, and that really cannot be um, underrepresented, understated. Uh, and again, I, I go back to Mazarin as one of those great figures in history. Uh, he is is one of the primary architects of this, even though France does not abide by it. And the reason I say that is, when my reading, you know, of course, France doesn't really tolerate Protestants. So, if you're in France, you're a Catholic. So meanwhile, the Huguenots... Yes, meanwhile, yes, we used that line to the, the Louis episode, meanwhile. Yeah. Um, and also, they're meddling in the Holy Roman Empire. Yeah. Uh, Louis puts together, or Mazarin, right afterwards, uh, puts together the League of the Rhine. Uh, some little treaty with 50 of the principalities uh, right there to the east of France. Now, I don't know, nothing really became of that, but you know, there he is, meddling in the Holy Roman Empire. Yep. So he is, they're still not quite living by it, but what's anybody going to do? But the principles are still laid out. And, of course, nations are always meddling in everybody's affairs. Yeah. Uh, we just recognize that it's wrong now. You know, uh, you know Russian bots uh, influencing Facebook and Twitter and, and things <laughs> like that. Or Chinese bots or North, Car North Korean Say bots. Say it ain't so. I mean, you know. All the more reason not to pay attention to Facebook. Or Twitter. Yes. 
Oh, what was it you called Twitter? Um, oh, I don't remember. Oh, there was something you called Twitter, which basically, I, I it's I'd have to find the episode, but you had a really great line about what. Uh, uh, yeah, I have Twitter. forgotten. Yeah, uh, a monumental so, waste of uh, electrons or something, probably. Oh no! Well, it was uh, uh, we were talking about something about the. Uh, not quite mob rule, but uh, you know something about how the mob does stuff. And oh well, that's Twitter. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, and it's it's only gotten worse. Yeah, they had a gin up and outrage mob. Yeah, just look at Twitter. Just yeah. look at Twitter. Um, outrage so, du jour. I don't want so much to check my because I did notes, listeners. I did listeners, notes. Uh, Robert, and the reason he's done such a, a magnificent job this episode is he is super prepared. He has notes. He has not seed of his pantsing this episode. I am not pantsing this. Oh, one other thing. Yes, please. Uh, we talked about this at the show prep. Um, and that is that this uh, piece, because subjects no longer have to follow the faith of their ruler, mm-hmm. uh, implicitly, if not explicitly, killed the concept of divine right of kings. Because yes, yes. if God has ordained you as king then God would ordain everybody who is your subject to be the same faith. Because, you know, it, it's, it only makes sense. Yeah. And then that's, that breakdown then leads you to Voltaire, John Locke, and Thomas Jefferson. Yes, yeah, so I was going to say, and, and piece, this whole, what this comes out of this, really is where what the Enlightenment is birthed in. Because you don't, if you don't have that kind of religious freedom, uh, you... It, I think it, it, that is what leads to other intellectual freedoms. Yeah. yeah. Uh, maybe not in a straight line, but it certainly is where it starts. Yeah. It, the birth and afterbirth of religious freedom. Yeah. And uh, maybe a, some of that's a lot of the afterbirth. But don't slip in it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Don't slip in it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> At least don't fall. You can slip in it, but don't fall in it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what's our time? 56. So. Oh, wow. That's, that's excellent. <coughs> right, get ready to. Get ready to wrap. Uh, final thoughts on this? I mean, I, I did a lot of talking here. And, uh, but well, but you did a magnificent job, and it, it well, was, I appreciate that. It was super. Well, this is one that ever since I started reading uh, Eric Flint's 1632 series, which takes place in the middle of the Thirty Years' War, yeah, right. this whole era has been a fascination of mine. And oh, the yeah. more I learned about it, especially how it ends, uh, the more important I realized it was. Yeah, I mean, you've been talking about Westphalia since we started doing... Yeah, it's it's the podcast. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you know because it it does it ties to everything. Uh, Absolutely. Again, the, the history is the is an interwoven thread, and you really can't pull on one thread. It's all going to come with it. Right, right. And you know, like and as we said, if you want to look at this, you still have, you you go back to uh, the popes and indulgences, and then why do you go back to that? Because the popes abandoned uh, Rome. Why did they abandon Rome? Because it wasn't safe there anymore, and the French had a lot of power, and so they invited the popes. I mean, it all, oh, so maybe this is the French's fault after all. <laughs> Cheese eating surrender monkeys. Yeah. Well, they weren't surrender monkeys then, but no. yeah, Mazarin no, yeah. knew what he was doing. Very much. He so. really did. Uh, he's one for the uh, heroes episodes, so or people you should know. Whatever you want. Whatever we're going to end up rephrasing that as, yeah. but yeah, he's I don't. He's going to be episodes in if we haven't figured out what to rephrase it as. I don't know that we ever will. Yeah, yeah. we we'll just keep working on it. Well, so what do you think? Turn it over to our man Francis. Yeah, Francis. What's next? Uh, easy stuff, boys. Code of honor. Excellent. All of our codes of honor. Absolutely. You don't know where we're going to go, but the quotations will be brilliant. The commentary will be scintillating. How you like that word? And we will just be at our best. So join us next episode. Hope you enjoyed another pointless discussion of eternal questions. Remember, new episodes publish every Friday at noon Eastern. Spread the word. We're on all the major podcast platforms, and leave us a comment or review because that helps others find us. We're on Instagram, Twitter, as well as our website, snakesandotters.com. I'm Martin. And I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Join us next week, same snake time, same otter channel.